One, two, three. This is Amari Purple Talk. Welcome to episode 71 of Amari Purple Talk, a podcast where I share my thoughts on the Prince musical singularity. I'm Richard Cole, your imagination funk soloist. Thank you once again for tuning in. Please leave your comments in the comments section below and please download on your favorite podcast platform. If you're listening on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And before we start today's show... It's about that time once again to remind everyone about part two of the Sign of the Time Super Deluxe Edition Twitter thread. That's hashtag Prince Twitter thread. The topics are the vault tracks. Check out the previous contributors as well as my own on the other versions of Strange Relationship. This week we have on December 29th, at DMSR blog and he will be discussing the track Crystal Ball that's the 7 inch edit of that track that's on the Super Deluxe and on December 30th we have at Laura Tebert with the track Big Tall Wall which there are two versions of that on the special edition I like the second version of that because every time I hear it I can picture the classic temps line up with David Ruffin, Paul Williams, and Eddie Kendricks. The rest of the Temptations tackling that track. Uh, there is um, I forget what the with the temps with a lot of soul. That album, that song would have fit perfectly on that album, and that had to have been like around 1966 or so when that temps album was out. So anyway. But looking forward to those Twitter threads. Check it out. And with that out of the way, let's start the show. This is the final episode of 2020. This is kind of like in the comic books. This will be like the big annual edition special 100 page special. If it was a Marvel comic, it'd be a big crossover event if it was a dc comic it would be the justice league crossing over meeting with the justice society but anyway this will be a big episode and we're going to start with our first topic and our first topic is the predictions for 2021 all right so This is it. We are a few days away from 2021. The contract that Prince signed with Warner Brothers that enabled him to get his masters back and all of the special deals that that contract entailed, which I'm certain that the Sign of the Times Super Deluxe Edition, uh, the 1999 Super Deluxe, Purple Rain Deluxe, those were part of that deal. And, of course, I guess little extra projects um, since 2016, like, say, Originals and Piano and the Microphone 83. So Warner Brothers has been enjoying some purple goodness all this time, but the agreement, which was signed in Prince's lifetime, will be coming to an end in 2021 in which all of that classic material except for the movie soundtracks will go to Sony and you know I mean check out everything that Sony Legacy has released 
whether it's, you know, Bob Dylan. You don't have to necessarily be a fan. I dig some Bob Dylan, you know, um, who else is on? Hendrix, they have a great, the estate has a great deal uh, with the, with uh, Sony and they've been putting out some great stuff since 2009. Miles Davis. So we're going to be getting some, some purple goodness. There'll be box sets, complete session sets. There'll be live box sets, individual live CD releases and compilations and we're going to dive into all of that today so basically what is going to happen starting with 2021 now we don't exactly know the details with the original warner brothers contract that was signed in 2014 and we don't know the exact date of termination of that particular uh, license agreement so what does it mean does it mean that Warner Brothers has another super deluxe in their pocket of course they will have the rights to say parade forever just like they'll have the rights to Purple Rain forever and I think as those start to roll out or Graffiti Bridge or even Batman if you want to include say vault material then from that point those things may solely be a Warner Brothers release with permission from the estate to utilize the vault material, or it could be a joint Warner Brothers Sony venture. So I'm going to speculate on four possibilities of what will be released in 2021. And the first idea would be that Warner Brothers releases a Parade Super Deluxe while Sony releases the remaining late period reissues. So basically, you know, the Sign of the Time Super Deluxe Edition, as well as the 1999 Super Deluxe Edition, those were major sellers for Warner Brothers um, you know the 1999 Super Deluxe Edition I think it's harder to get now at a decent price if you go on the Prince of States website those materials are sold out and I guess if you can get it elsewhere you're going to be paying a lot more than retail and but don't worry I believe that within a few years time that 1999 Super Deluxe either in its current configuration or a more complete set will eventually come out on Sony. So, you know, it's going to take some patience, folks. But, you know, if you're not willing to check out even more money to still try to get your hands on, whether it's the CD or the vinyl, then you still have that opportunity. But that being said, with Sign of the Times, you know, being number one in everybody's year in polls for the best reissue set or the best, uh, excuse me, best box set that's around. Then obviously Warner Brothers is going to try to, you know, stay with the momentum. And that could mean releasing, say, a parade super deluxe a lot sooner. That's a possibility. And if that is the case, then, you know, what's Sony going to come out with? And the only thing I think if that is a possibility is that there are still a few items to reissue. There's the Crystal Ball 1998 compilation. You know, that's three CDs. If they bundle the truth with it, that makes it four. Or they might do, say, an individual release with Crystal Ball, an individual release with The Truth, and, I don't know, what else? You know, maybe something like, say, Expectation, um, Chocolate Invasion, or something like that. They can, you know, spend the rest of 20, uh, 2021 
just finishing out those sets for CD and vinyl release while Parade once again swings for the fences and kind of capitalize on Parade. So that's one possibility. Second possibility is that Warner Brothers releases a Parade Super Deluxe in 2021 while Sony starts a classic albums reissue campaign along with a career spanning box set. Now that'd be a lot of purple goodness we'll get in 2021 if that's a possibility. You know, there's a big, you know, say a big parade super deluxe. It could come out in June. It could come out September and kind of in the interim, you know, whether before, say, Sony, I would say, logically speaking, Sony would release, say, maybe the first three albums on vinyl and CD and, you know, maybe towards Christmas release a career spanning box set. That is a possibility. Now, again, we don't know what the terms of the contract entailed as far as Warner Brothers. We don't know an exact termination date. Does 2021 mean that, say, March 1st, it runs out, and then at that point, Sony can hit the ground running? Does it expire, say, December of 2021 again giving Warner Brothers a chance to do something else and you know if it's um, I use a Netflix Marvel analogy on another possibility that say if this contract runs out like with the Marvel shows Daredevil Punisher Jessica Jones Iron Fist that type of thing. When Netflix terminated those shows, you know, even though Marvel owns all of those characters, there's a stipulation in that contract that said that, well, you can't utilize those characters for at least, you know, for a period of two years, you know, and that could be a similar possibility with the Warner Brothers you know, Sony situation. You know, I hope not, but, you know, we're it's television versus records, but, you know, a contract is a contract. And if there's language in that contract or language in that license agreement that says, you know, yes, it runs out in 2021, but you can't release Dirty Mind as a standalone or a deluxe edition or anything like that until... 2022 or 2023 you know again i hope not you know but that's something that could exist but again a distinct you know a possibility could be that warner brothers releases a parade super deluxe and sony could either a begin a reissue campaign with the classic material starting with you know for you prince and Dirty Mind for 2021, and then 2022, you get, you know, three more, you know, Controversy 1999, you can't do Purple Rain, so you skip to Around the World in a Day, and do it that way, or, before they even do that, you could have a big Parade Super Deluxe from Warner Brothers, and a career-spanning box set, you know, by the end of the year. That could be a possibility. A third possibility is Warner Brothers keeps its movie soundtracks close to the chest and releases anniversary super deluxe box sets in joint venture with Sony for the vault material while Sony starts or continues with its 2021 plans. So regardless of what Sony would have, whether it's finishing out the later reissues that they have, like Crystal Ball, Chocolate Invasion, etc., 
Warner Brothers decides to sit things out and say 2024 you get a massive complete purple rains purple rains purple rain sessions a complete box set of all of you know what was originally intended all the originals style uh guide vocals demos whatever you want to call it and just do a big you know 2024 you know 40 year anniversary edition and then come 2026 do the same thing with parade and you know go on to batman and so on and so forth you could do you know that could be a possibility and meanwhile whatever plans that sony has they just continue with it. So if they want to drop a box set, if they want to start a reissue campaign with the classic material, if they want to just, on a whim, just do, hey, you know, we're going to do a, you know, new Power Soul Super Deluxe. They could do that. Wouldn't be my first choice, but they could do that. And the final possibility or fourth and final possibility that I could think of is that Warner Brothers has one more Super Deluxe set left on its contract with Prince and releases it in 2021 while Sony continues with whatever plans, you know, if it's 2021 or if it is a case of Warner Brothers just having one more round in the chamber before they even do a parade super deluxe edition and just kind of, again, get that big cash grab before they lose everything else. And Sony does whatever it plans to do, whether it's 2021 or 2022. Now, remember last week uh, when we discussed the rumor that a sign of the or excuse me diamonds and pearls super deluxe edition was going to be released in lieu of a parade super deluxe well um i put up a poll last week and actually it's got actually just as i'm talking the final results have finally tabulated so the original question was if a Diamonds and Pearls Super Deluxe Edition is released in 2021, which label is going to release it? And a good 75% of you Amari Purple Talk supporters said that Sony would be the one to release a Diamonds and Pearls Super Deluxe Edition, while 25% said Warner Brothers would release it. So, I don't know. I think, yeah, Sony would probably be the most logical choice to release a Diamonds and Pearls Super Deluxe Edition. However, like I said, given the fourth and final possibility, if and depending on when that license agreement expires... You know, does it mean that once it's terminated, that Sony can immediately start diving into the classic material, you know, start meeting with Michael Howell if they haven't already met already to discuss plans for 2021? Does it mean that we won't see any official product from Sony regarding any classic material until 2022? You know, it's a very, very good question on that. But again, if the terms of that contract, say if it runs out in December of 2021, then yeah, Sony could just, you know, I mean, it's a one, two punch. You hold that last classic release, whatever it is, whether it's diamonds and pearls, whether it's around the world in a day or whatever, you drop that. And then come 2022 or 2023 
or whenever they feel it necessary, they could easily drop a parade box set. So, I don't know. It's a tough one to call. I really don't have a a clear path to what would actually happen in 2021. But I would say if, if it's a perfect world, then it would be parade dropping in 2021. Then again, whatever Sony's plans are, I would say, you know, with a pattern of say, like maybe Jimi Hendrix, when they acquired the license, it was a thing of reissuing new, um, how can I put it? Basically, they re-released the three albums that he did in his lifetime, which was Are You Experienced, Axis Bold as Love, and Electric Ladyland. And then other things that had been under contract with MCA, with the Hendrix Estate, such as the Blues Compilation, um, First Rays of the New Rising Sun. Then those things were reissued. Uh, there was a box set that was originally issued around, oh man, around 2000, I think. Uh, it was released under MCA, but then Sony reissued it. Oh man, I can't even remember. Let's see, so 2009. Uh, it was around maybe 2010, 2012, somewhere around there. And on top of that, they released their own box set uh, called West Coast Seattle Boy. So under Sony, you have access to both of those box sets. And I mean, just all the different compilations that they've released. Um, I'm still trying to play catch up with it. You know, it's like, you know, between because Prince releases get the first dibs, you know, um, I grabbed those first. So I'm kind of behind. There's been a 50th anniversary release of Electric Ladyland. Um, there's the complete band of gypsies at the Fillmore. You know, that stuff I like to have. There's one that had just been released, uh, DVD, documentary, and CD, live at Maui. So again, you know, there's a lot of stuff to look forward to with the Sony releases with Prince when they get their hands on the classic material. So it just takes a little patience. So we're going to have to, again, we're going to have to eat our vegetables, folks, take our vitamins. You know, we're going to have to, you know, whoop this COVID and, you know, we got to be around for, tw you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 more years because there's going to be some stuff dropping on that. But what's most important is what do you think will be either Warner Brothers or Sony's play for 2021? Leave me a comment and let me know your thoughts. And so, like I said, this is the big year end Amari Purple Talk of all Amari Purple Talks of 2020. It's been one crazy year. We're not going to get into any of that. We're just going to continue with the purple morsels and going to kind of end this show with a couple of fan submitted topics. And if you want to submit a topic suggestion or a question for Amari Purple Talk, please click the link to my website in the show notes or visit me on Twitter at Richard Cole underscore now. Please include the hashtag Amari Purple Talk and you might hear your topic or question on a future episode. So let's start with our first topic suggestion and our first submission comes from Jim Hubblestone and Jim Hubblestone writes, Hi Richard, what's your opinion on how the estate deals with the Prince legacy. I think they get too little out of it. Why don't they release the concerts through, let's see, this is something called nugs.net. Let's see, Bruce Springsteen does that and so many others. 
This way, you also prevent people from buying bootlegs, which are additional income. Prince was such a great visionaire with the internet, but I think he missed this. And what do you think about releasing each quarter something from his vault with a quarterly subscription, like Third Man Records does? It's really top quality. Okay, I don't always agree with what they put out, like Johnny Cash, who has nothing to do with Third Man Records at all. Metallica also started vault releases this year. And one last one. What do you think about having a pressing plant? Or I guess having the estate own a pressing plant like Paisley Park Pressing in Chan Hansen. All right, Jim, thanks for submitting that question. And yeah, let's see. Let's start with my opinion on how the estate deals with Prince's legacy. Okay, well, if you are a longtime listener of Amari Purple Talk, Probably since episode two, I have been, you know, kind of championing the fact that the Hendrix estate is one of the best templates to have when it comes to dealing with that artist's legacy in terms of, you know, record releases, videos the whole bit um it's among my favorite um prior to them getting the deal with sony when they had the licensing agreement with mca records or universal i mean they had been knocking it out of the park this is before well i would say after the beatles anthology but before the 2009 remasters for the Beatles material. Um, of course, Bob Dylan, the way that Sony handled all of his bootleg stuff or vault material since 1991. I mean, they have something for every era of Bob Dylan. So if you're a Bob Dylan fan from just the acoustic stuff, there's box sets for you. If there's fans of his kind of classic electric albums period from 65, 66, you know, up and through early 70s, that's an era for you. When he went through his Christian phase, his born again phase, there's box sets for you. If you like the Rolling Thunder tour and Blood on the Tracks, it's for you. So I've always been championing that as that's the template to have or if not that frank zappa would be a close second on how to handle the vault material and a lot of your question jim centers around it's closer to the frank zappa template than the hendrix template um i'm not familiar with the uh not familiar with the nugs.net uh but you say that Bruce Springsteen uses utilizes that site to you know promote a lot of concerts. Uh, but I did do some digging into the Third Man Records, and that was a label, or actually it was just a way for Jack White of the White of uh, the White Stripes. Uh, I mean, this was a, a template that. Prince talked about back in the 90s when he was trying to get out of his Warner Brothers contract. I don't know how much of a Prince fan that Jack White is or, you know, how in depth did he follow Prince in the 90s going through all of that. But the more I started digging into this and kind of researching Third Man Records and what it entails, yes, this would be an absolute perfect move for the estate and as far as the way it's handling vault material or both of these organizations handle vault material to kind of beat the boots which was something that frank zappa started yeah i think something kind of in between would work 
we're in an age now where intellectual property is sort of the new currency. You know, never mind about, say, cryptocurrency or, you know, everything's becoming more digitized these days. And for the entertainment industry as a whole, yeah, the classics, I mean, of any era, you know, from old, old Hollywood to, you know, maybe as recent as the 90s, you know, anybody with a significant catalog of material, whether it's films, whether it's records, there seems to be more in that intellectual property that seems to be more valuable to that industry than anybody that's current that has a hit record. You know, to which, for the most part, most of them are, sadly, disposable. It, they've almost become disposable income. While you see Abbey Road as an album, consistently sales you see just about every six months purple rain re-enters the charts it rises higher in the charts at any given point and sales units you see where you know paul mccartney you know he has archive material but dropped one of his best albums in a long time. And he's been pretty consistent the last, you know, four or five album releases, you know, for practically about 10 years, you know, his, I guess he's kind of hit a stride or kind of got comfortable with the fact that, yeah, I'm Paul McCartney. And yeah, if a certain song sounds like a Beatles song, Hey, <laughs> it's because it's me, <laughs> you know? So, You know, that, like I said, there's a, a level of more, there's more value in intellectual property or a, a artist catalog or an entire body of work than anybody that can just have a hit and be here today, gone tomorrow. You know, it's sad that there's not real artistry that's being promoted as mainstream. You know, it's all disposable. Everybody, you know, every 10 artists have the same producer or a couple of producers doing the whole thing. You know, it's not about the artist anymore. It's that producer style that you're buying into with that. And, you know, even with that said, you know, there's a lot of black entertainers that, end up being out of the pool with that you know never mind like a taylor swift you know you know you see that stuff still happens you know somebody like her can still have her master recordings yanked from out of her control or it was never in her control in the first place so it can be passed off from buyer to buyer to buyer but with black artists and entertainers yeah, there's very few that still to this day can hang on to whatever it is they're publishing or their master recordings or some level of control within their industry. And to, I guess, answer the final part of that question in regards to should Paisley Park have its own pressing plant? Uh, I don't know the full legal ins and outs about it. I personally don't see it as a bad idea. Because if you can control the product, yeah, you should be able to control the means of distribution. And I think that's something that Prince was aware of. I know he was investigating alternative styles of distribution to bypass because that's the that's the thing you know um things that i've talked about with 
other musicians or other people that are into music and especially black music, that's a key area of control that we don't have. And that's distribution. Yeah, you can do it nowadays, whether, you know, you can print up a bunch of CDs someplace, sell them out the trunk of your car. You know, that's, you know, old NWA style or old MC Hammer style of doing it. You know, now you have the Internet to where there is no middleman that's needed. You just upload and create a system to where your fans can download it, whether you do it for a fee or you do it for free to, you know, get enough promotion. So you do rake in the bucks in other areas. But when it comes to physical media, then no, you know, that playing field once again, has never been fair. And if you look at an example of, say, the Musicology album, to where Prince was able to put physical copies, build it into the ticket price, and he cleaned up, I think, better than going through the normal distribution channels of even Sony, I think, who was he was dealing with at the time of that album. So I know he was definitely aware of alternative distribution because maybe he realized that is an industry or part of an industry that is too big. But, you know, that doesn't mean that it's something that's impossible to achieve. So anyone, you know, who wants that type of ownership Yeah, definitely. I think that's a great idea, you know, to create your own distribution channel to where, yeah, it can either shake up the status quo of what the industry is doing or put yourself in a position that should you have to deal with them, you retain ownership of your own destiny. And that you don't get shortchanged in the long run because that is or has been and probably continues to be a major pitfall because that is a lot of money that seems to end up being unaccounted for a lot. And especially if you find yourself in an industry and you're not making the money you think you should make. And when it comes time to audit, it's easy to bury that money, you know, in within those channels. So yeah, if you can control that part of the board, then you will have a clear picture of how much money is owed to you in that particular situation. So definitely, Jim, thanks for submitting that question. I hope that answered it. Um, If anybody else wants to chime in, of course, leave a comment and Let me know your thoughts. And with that, we're going to move on to our next and final question, actually. And this comes from one of our longtime listeners, uh, Stephanie Mills. And Stephanie writes, hey, Richard, hope all is well with you this evening. The show topic I came up with is something that was touched on recently. If it's too touchy, I understand. And that question is, does it bother fans that Prince didn't have any children, and if so, why? If you can't discuss that, then here's one that's a bit lighter. How do you want to celebrate Prince when the pandemic is over? For example, I want to go to Paisley Park because I've never been, and I wish someone would have a Prince brunch like Tanya Giddens has with the Purple Paisley Brunch, or the House of Blues Gospel Brunch. Those are my topics. Great show today. All right, and thanks, Stephanie, for submitting that series of questions. And, yeah, I kind of wrestled with the first part of this question because, yeah, it's a heavy subject. Um, I know in the past, I've kind of tried to steer clear of you know, dealing with either, you know, the loss of Prince himself or what he might have been feeling in regards to, 
not being able to produce heirs. So, but the more I thought about it, dealing with this question, I know it has come up in Neil Carlin's book, This Thing Called Life, uh, which I did a review on a few episodes. So if you haven't heard it, uh, you can go check that out. Uh, I do recommend you checking out that book. Um, I know there was one commenter that kept recommending I get the audio book version. Uh, I did get it. I did listen to portions of it. And I don't know, I might do a follow up review somewhere down the line, maybe a couple of episodes down the line. But uh, back to this question. Um, yeah, it's something that has come up uh, through that book. And yeah, I mean, it kind of, you know, reading that. I don't know, it's something I guess we've all taken for granted that yeah you know that's a that's a heavy loss and that's something you don't get over you know that's something that you know you might learn to live with it but you don't get over it and yeah probably in the face of the public you know he might have been okay you know but behind closed doors within the confines of paisley park you know when he's alone then you know you're wrestling with that. You're wrestling with those demons. And, you know, it's a thing of, yeah, only he knows what it feels like. There's only one prince, you know. Yeah, there's whatever band that he's had. There were people that he was close to, but there's only one prince. You know, I always now liken it to George Harrison's assessment of Elvis. You know, it's like there was only one Elvis you know, as opposed to where there were four Beatles sharing that experience. So one could keep the other one kind of sane, you know, if it got to be a bit too much, you know, or if it got to be too much for all four, they had each other. But when it's just one entity and then you kind of have everybody that's kind of on the payroll, whether it's a band member, no matter how close or how, fr you know, how much of a friend you could be. It's you that signed the contract. It's you that, you know, has the name in the marquee. And it's you that all the fans are going after. So, you know, that's, you know, that's something that when it's just you, it's a different way of handling it or not handling it. But as far as does it bother fans that he didn't have any heirs? And so why does it bother them? Uh, speaking for myself, you know, I remember, you know, listening to the Hit and Run Tour, one of the shows uh, from 2000. And I guess each part of the tour, it's like in the middle of the concert and he's kind of, you know, kind of going on the rant about not owning his master's. And, you know, when will we when will we be paid for the work that we've done? And yeah, you know, that was a, you know, point of contention, you know, because it's like, yeah, you know, he was telling his fans that it's like, look, you know, what am I going to leave my heirs to? And keep in mind, you know, this is right around the second marriage. You know, we now know everything with Maite. You know, and that was tragic, you know, in, in both circumstances to only have one live for just a couple of days and then to miscarry the other one. You know, but remember that at this time, point in time, it was he was on his second marriage. So that possibility, at least then, might have still existed. And apparently, since it didn't happen then, yeah, I think then you kind of started to hear more of the talk about, oh, yeah, the the stuff in the vault, it'll come out. I won't have anything to do with it. I'll be long gone. You know, it'll be somebody else working it out. And the fact that there was no will, 
you know, I, th I think on that particular level, you know, it bothers the fan base because, you know, there's some strong opinions all the way around. Like I said, we talk about on this show and other shows and Twitter threads and everything. And yeah, we've been enjoying what we've been getting and the fact that the music makes us feel so good. But, you know, there's strong opinions on the other side, too, that it's like, oh, the estate shouldn't blah, 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 blah. And as I've said a couple of times on other episodes, the bottom line, it's the family that's calling the shots. And, you know, here we're talking about ownership of master recordings and publishing and rights and ownership and licensing deals and stuff like that. You know, there are people or families that fight over a broken down shack somewhere, you know, because they think they can get something out of it. You know, that is a byproduct of a system of greed, a system, you know, where you see whether it's elite or royalty or whatever time period, you know, we're talking about, but we've been conditioned as Western you know, civilization that wealth, you know, material wealth is more valuable than anything. And again, when it trickles down to, you know, whether it's middle class or lower middle class or working class or whatever class you want to call it, you know, it's it's a program of, like I said, you know, it could be somebody's last 20 bucks or all they had was 20 bucks. And you will best believe that when they pass on, there's going to be two people fighting over it, you know, or handling it or not handling it properly. And there's always going to be opinions in regards to that. So I think when it comes to those strong opinions, that's what they perceive is that. It's not necessarily a Janie Hendrix. And yeah, I've had to deal with a responder, um, you know, because this person thinks that Janie Hendrix is such a crook, you know, but she was a kid when Hendrix died and she was the only family member that Al Hendrix, Jimmy's dad, could trust with it. You know, never mind any other siblings, you know, they got what they got. One sued and settled you know so that relative got whatever they got out of it and everything's fine now but she was the one that Al Hendricks chose so when he passed on she gets to call the shots you know so and again you know you don't really hear a lot of complaints about Jimmy's legacy or his what's been released by the Hendricks estate I think they've done a great job. And I think, too, I think they've had people in place that were also there from the beginning. And Prince didn't have that particular luxury. You know, there's people that come and go or came and went on a whim. There were people that came and went that weren't necessarily, say, qualified for their jobs. But, you know, that was his choice to make and so now here we are in 2020 no will the materials divided between two record labels the estate even though it's the family because there's no definition on which family member does what or who does what then you have this entity that really absolutely knows nothing about the record industry that's calling shots yeah, you know, it's I can see where that opinion is a very, very strong one. And it might have been different if, you know, say if say if Amir had been 100 percent healthy and never mind that part, you know, where he got to live to be. So if you're talking 1996, 06, 16, he would have been 20. You know, that's some heavy, that's a heavy, heavy burden. But then you would have had 
Maite there. She would have facilitated the, you know, kind of the Yoko Ono role to where she would have been calling the shots. And then as he became of age, he would have been able to finally or help call some shots. You know, and I see like um, Sean Lennon and I see Danny Harrison, you know, talking about their respective father's legacies. Apparently, they have been groomed to call the shots because, you know, Yoko's kind of up there now. Olivia, you know, uh, Harrison, I, you know, like I said, it's it's heavy you know, to, to make those decisions. Yoko has more business sense than Olivia Harrison, I would assume. But both Danny Harrison and Sean Lennon have both had experience within the record industry to have some very valid opinions. You know, so there's that, you know, there's that to think about. So yeah, it, it probably would have been more beneficial to have had Maite in a mirror in place, you know, in an alternate reality. That would have, you know, that would have made perfect sense. So I can't speak for every Prince fan, but I'm aware that, yeah, I think those strong opinions are born out of the fact that with that void of not having children, then, you know, no slight to the siblings or anything, but... Yeah, it's like I said, it's hard to they don't have the control that they need to have to maybe make things better. And even if they did, it's getting all of them on the same page where in this particular case, you know, again, in an alternate reality, you would have had at least at minimum an Amir. You know, hey, if he was able to have more, then there would have been at least maybe two or three calling the shots or at least two calling the shots in that particular case so yeah so that might be why it's a it's a heavy concept to grab and i mean you know we're four years in you know to this now going on five and yeah it's still heavy subject to tackle you know it's you know you know for me you know doing this show it's it's me working it out you know dealing with that because you know heck i thought you know he'd be around to at least 70 something or you know 90 you know even but but here we are and we have each other you know we have the other podcast shows you know that i tune in and get into and enjoy and vice versa and the other writers and fans I contribute to the Twitter threads, you know, that, you know, hopefully we bring a lot of positivity and goodness and it helps all of us get through and deal with it, you know, even four years later and, you know, beyond. So that's that. And then the next one, which is going to be a lighter tone, uh, is how do I want to celebrate Prince when the pandemic is over. Well, uh, I want to go to a physical record store just for a start. <laughs> you know, I miss going to a physical record store. Time really um, is a factor just because of the non essential, let's see, the essentially non essential essential gig that I do from day to day. Um, that kind of prevents me from really having enough time to venture back out into a record store. Uh, but as far as like wanting to go to Paisley Park, definitely. Yeah, I want to go. Um, unlike a lot of the other hosts, they've got to go to the celebrations. I haven't had a chance to go, but years ago, I uh, got to at least be at the front door at Paisley Park trying to get in. Um, me, another musician friend of mine, we were there that weekend for the Minneapolis Black Music Expo. This was 94, and I had family that 
lived out there and aunt and uncle and some cousins that lived out there and um my uncle we um he was you know just kind of driving us around uh he was kind of doing some work at a radio station so we went to hang out with him while he was on the air actually we got to be on the air and i wish i still had the tape of that wish i could dig that up somewhere but anyway we were did that and then just kind of driving around, you know, he was showing us St. Paul and, you know, and just driving around. We saw the diner that's on the front of the Alexander O'Neill album cover. That was cool. Um, but then, you know, we just kind of on a whim. He was like, yeah, you know, this is Paisley Park, you know, and and he's pretty good at talking his way into stuff. And. You know, I guess, you know, he's like, well, I'll talk you guys into getting into Paisley Park. Unfortunately, well, we didn't have any tapes with us anyway, so it wouldn't have mattered as much. But he tried to talk us into it. We never got past the front door. The the guy on the intercom basically just shut us down. But that was cool, you know, but it was nice to be there. And I know I got some video of the outside of it somewhere. But yeah, but I would love to go to the celebration um and hang out with everybody that you know i only know is you know twitter handles or i've only heard or seen on youtube and things like that so that would be one way um but another one i think i guess it's just you know business as usual trying to make this show a better show than what it is um reaching more people, communicating with more people. You know, I also miss the um, the protege acts too. You know, I mean, I want to see the time again. I haven't seen them in a long, long time, um, live and in person. Uh, I saw F Deluxe in 2013. You know, I would love to see another show. You know, they're all incredibly nice people. Got to meet them and hang out a little bit after the show, you know, so, I mean, I miss that stuff, you know, and yeah, it's, it's few people left to see, you know, like I said, there's the time, there's F Deluxe that's left, um, you know, a lot of the major acts, um, Parliament Funkadelic, yeah, yeah, still want to go, you know, see them again, hadn't seen them in a long, long time, and stuff, you know, but there's, but that's the thing, you know, it's starting to get fewer and fewer people to see like that. So, yeah, I mean, I definitely want things to get better. So either they can come to our town or, you know, get enough ducats together and go to where they are and see them perform and stuff. But that's how I really want to celebrate it. And two, You know, again, you know, I do this campaign for the members of the time, but it, you know, it applies to anybody, the revolution, all of them. I would love to celebrate by getting them into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You know, that's something I think that Prince would be very happy about. You know, that's another way to celebrate his legacy, you know. Um, But as far as, again, you know, the pandemic being over, Then once that happens, like I said, I would love to see live shows again and go to the celebrations, you know, finally be in a position to do that. So I think that is pretty much it in a nutshell. And once again, thanks to everyone for submitting their topics. Um, Keep sending them in. You know, this is a lot of fun. I enjoy doing this aspect of it. It's great that I come up with topics, but... It's been more fun listening to what you guys have to say, too. And like I said, if I pick it, it will get read. So by all means, keep sending them in. And that is going to end our big super end of the year superhero annual special of Amari Purple Talk. Remember to always check out my website, AmariCommunications.com. Check out all the upcoming projects. Buy some Amari 
merchandise, whether it's Amari Purple Talk t-shirts, Amari Purple Talk mugs, uh, there's We Funk to the Last Band t-shirts, all kind of good Amari goodness that you can get, and those proceeds help to keep this show going as well as finance some of these upcoming projects as well so by all means check that out and have a very happy new year and until we get to that new year and even beyond because we still got a long way to go be safe take your vitamins keep your immune system boosted Let's try to leave this planet better than how we found it. And, of course, keep it purple and on the one.